Well, hello and welcome to the July 16, 2023 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana, specifically Hammond, Indiana, and that's why we call ourselves Hammond's Bible Church. Our contact information is at the end of this video. Please use it to get in touch with our church, myself. We uh, will also give you location service hours on that uh, website and looking forward to be able to minister to you in any way that we can. This past week we had a great soccer camp outreach, dealt with some rain, but through the midst of the rain and the storms, uh, we were able to meet some new people, people of the community, get the gospel out, and very thankful for our congregation and their high level of service to put on such an incredible camp. We had uh, over 130 kids sign up and because of rain and other factors we didn't always get that amount but very thankful for the opportunity to serve the community so lots more going on in the summer and i look forward to having uh, a special speaker in a couple weeks we're going to have matt mcgrew at the church pastor who's going to be doing the camp checkpoint for the junior high uh, ages and then we're also going to be have one of our missionaries at the service sean boyd so looking forward to having a lot go on at cfc throughout the summer as well as our church picnic before sadly the kids got to go back to school can't believe kids go back to school in august but that's the way it is today well we're going to be studying god's word in this video and we'll be in the book of revelation so have your bibles ready First, let us transition into our music ministry. Then we'll come back and have your Bible ready to study God's Word.
Would you read the end of a book first? I mean, would you read the last chapter when you opened up a book and said, I'm going to start reading this, I'm going to read the last chapter? Most people would say, no, I don't want to do that. It ruins the enjoyment of reading a book. The development of a plot line, the discovery of what's going to happen next, it's all part of the enjoyment. Now, I know a pastor who, when he has an academic book, reads the last chapter first because he wants to know where a book is going theologically, and I get that. But for a fiction book or even a historical book where you're trying to read something to uh, watch how a, play, a story plays out, nobody wants to get to the end first. But I recognize endings are important. Uh, when we come to look at a book, how a book ends is really important. And, I found, as I did some research this week, that in writing there are people who write the end of their books, their screenplays, first. For example, in screenplays, a famous director, playwright, Francis, Ford's, um, Francis Ford Coppola, who did American Graffiti and The Godfathers when they wrote the screenplays, wrote the endings first. And the um, screenwriter, David Seidler, wrote The King's Speech with the ending first. So then work everything towards it because just want to make sure everything fits as you get to the end. The end of a book is critical. We're making that very clear. And as I've often stated, when we come to the end of a study of a book of the Bible, I always say all good things must come to an end. Realizing that there is going to be an end, I found this very kind of humorous philosophical quote. It says this, um, only bad books have good endings. If a book is any good, its ending is always bad because you don't want a good book to end. And so the idea here is that you don't want a book to end that's really good. And I get that. And it's sort of like, you know, tongue in cheek. Well, what are you going to do? Every book has to have an ending. Now, when you look at books that are out there, there are some books that are absolutely good books, but they don't end up great because of the way they end. You got this book and you're like, wow, this is really good. This is really interesting. And then you come to the end of it and it just falls flat. And we're going to discuss that because when you don't have a good ending, you have a lousy ending, it really takes away from elevating a book from good to greatness or from even, even calling it good because if the ending falls flat. Um, there are some books that come on web, website lists that have lousy endings. You know, you can go to a website and you can say, give me a list of books that have lousy endings. And you'd be surprised, some of you, um, with some of the books that are on there. I looked at a lot of the list at different sites and some books that I have read, I felt clearly are uh, appropriately on that list, like Romeo and Juliet. I think that was number one on a lot of books uh, list. And then there was Catcher in the Rye, which I recently read in the past few years. 
and just don't like the ending. And Murder on the Orient Express, we'll talk more about that one in a bit, but clearly Murder on the Orient uh, Express by Agatha Christie is a book that I just don't like the ending. And then there was a list of movies that have lousy endings like World War Z with Brad Pitt or The Accountant with Ben Affleck, I Am Legend by Will Smith, some of more recent movies for people who are into the movie genre. They don't have good endings. Now, why am I t talking about this is because I want us to understand what makes a lousy ending, what makes a good ending. Um, people that look at the idea of a bad ending is, is, number one, you have a disappointing ending, right? Where the main character dies, like, oh, you're hoping that something good would happen. But Romeo and Juliet die, it's a bad ending, it's just a disappointing ending. Or it's nothing significant happens. And you look at Catcher in the Rye, or there's a, a book called Breaking Dawn, it's the whole in that vampire series. I've talked before about how vampires were very popular in the past 20 years. And I guess in this book, one, one of the books called Breaking Dawn, uh, the, the whole story is about a huge war breaking out. And then at the end, the war never breaks out, and that's the end. So nothing significant happened. Or it's anticlimactic. doesn't make um, a lot of sense. Like for me, Mur Murder on the Orient Express, it just wasn't happy with that ending. Or it's a stupid ending. Um, it's not where you just sit there and say, that just, it, you know, just doesn't make sense. And I think a lot of disaster books, you know, disaster movies fall into that category where, you know, how somebody survives and you think, you know, that, that, that there's no way they should have survived, right? It just, it doesn't make sense. It's a stupid ending. Um, the TV show Lost had a stupid ending, right? I thought that was a stupid ending. Um, very predictable, if you could say, you know where, you know, like in the book Gone Girl, the evil people all gang up and they, they become a team, the evil couple in the, the book Gone Girl. Or finally, you could just look at a, a book and say, well, nothing, nothing gets explained. It just ends, right? It just ends. Like 2001 <laughs> Space Odyssey, the movie, at least. It just ends and it's like, I need some explanation. Nothing makes sense. So, the books that are considered good, like The Great Gatsby, Gone with the Wind, Kill a Mockingbird, they bring and they tie things together. But for us who want to study the Bible, I think we need to understand all the elements of a great ending. It doesn't disappoint. Something significant happens. It's not anticlimactic. It doesn't have a stupid ending. It, and it's not predictable. And when I, when I say it's not predictable, I'm, I'm going to give you something that when you really when we're all said and done, it's going to be a surprise. Uh, you're going to, you know, if you've read Revelation 22 before, I'm going to give you kind of like an interesting plot twist, if you will. So hang on, stick with me, and we'll go through that. But I do think that uh, you get some good explanations as we wrap up in this book. So the goal of a good book is to have resolution and to deal with the transformation of the characters. And I believe the Bible meets this goal as we come into Revelation 22. So turn your Bibles if you haven't already. Revelation 22, we're going to look at the book of all books. We're going to look at the Bible, and we're going to look at the very last chapter of its final book. So it really does serve as the end of the book of the Bible, all 66 books. And the book of Revelation is uniquely placed to give us that ending. For those of you who have not been with us, the context of this book is that it was written by Apostle John about 95 AD. It was written with a specific outline where John tells us he's going to write down what he has seen, which was chapter 1, what is, which was chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches of Revelation, and then what will be chapters 4 through 22, the prophecy that laid out. And here we are at the end, and sort of that includes the um, conclusion of the book as well. So we're in that future set, but it also provides the conclusion. The book has told us in the prophecy about the seal, trumpet, and bold judgments, how God is trying to shake the earth to try to get them to repent, to get right with him. But the world doesn't want God. In the end, every unbeliever on the earth dies. It's not, not very good, but we see every believer will end up in heaven. So there's a you know, little contrast there, but we understand how this is playing out and, and how this is serving as a warning to the world. And as we come into chapter 20, after God has 
had the Battle of Armageddon where he, he was victorious and every unbeliever has died. He sets up what we call the Millennial Kingdom and a thousand year reign. And you would think that people would be excited for a utopia on earth, but sadly, mankind at the end of that rebels, which leads us into the final judgment. And we said, when we studied chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, called the Great White Throne Judgment. Amazingly, amazingly, when you come to chapter 21, verse 1, at this point, death never occurs in human history. Again, from this point on, there's never death again. And in chapter 21, God starts telling us about the eternal state and how heaven comes to earth and the new Jerusalem and how there's a configuration on the new planet as he's wiped away every tear. It's in that discussion that we come to chapter 22, and it's the final, final part. So I wanted to keep it separate. Now, what is God going to finally, finally end up with? And so I call this the final um, words to focus on, to focus on heaven, the final description, and the final words of warning and warming. I'll explain that in a bit. But as we come to verses 1 to 5, here is... A description, right? A description, this is a tangible. This is something, you, you know, that is going to be seen. And so this is an eternal look on why you should want to be here. I think this is being incentivized to you. So we pick up in chapter 22, verse 1. He says, And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have the need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because of the Lord. God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Final description. And I call this the eternal state, and I have you fill in the blank if you have sermon notes. Now, I always tell people who are watching these videos, if you're not a regular attender of Christian Fellowship Church, you're not on our regular emailing list, you email the church, I will send these out to you, these sermon notes. And I left this blank for those who were on a, in service on a Sunday morning, that the idea here is to focus on, this is the eternal state. And I didn't want to just say heaven, because we recognize heaven comes to earth. That was very clear in chapter 21. Heaven comes to earth. And it's the eternal state. And we're not Mormons in the sense that we live, we have our own planet or something like that, but we do live tangibly on earth. And it's important that people grasp this so that they don't think that God has it just floating on clouds. And it's, it's a constant emphasis of mine because I know there's a lot of unbelievers that foolishly take that and think that you know, we're like these spirits that have no substance and we just float on clouds and play harps all day. That's not it. Mankind is going to live on earth forever. Well. In, in this section, just again, trying to keep this as we're trying to move through and trying to keep the jet tour idea that we initially started with, the idea that you know when we started studying the book of Revelation, we we're going to go into every detail. I just wanted to point out there are four items that are described here, okay? And, and the four items are, first and foremost, the river of the water of life. You see the river of the water of life. Now, what is this river? It's interesting, it is water, it brings life. Um, it's not mentioned specifically in the book of Genesis. You do have some rivers in the book of Genesis, but the water of life is, I believe, tied to Psalm 46. Listen to this verse, I'm just gonna quote it. Psalm 46, verses four and five, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the most high God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her just as the break of dawn. And so I think God foreshadowed that, that now we get the description. It is not by accident that water is needed for life. It's not by accident that water here is playing a key role when Jesus talks about you know, coming to him because he is also going to supply um, water of life, John chapter 7. Um, it's not an accident that water is used when God talks about the fact that people who don't have water, um, his water, and again in um, Jeremiah chapter 2, are going for cisterns that hold no water because God bountifully supplies water. So people, some people want to say, well, because this is flowing from God. It's an endless river, and you know God's word is like 
ongoing water refreshes the soul. That could be this the as aspect of the symbolism, but I do think this is a tangible aspect of water. How it provides life, I'm not sure, and I don't want to leave you hanging, but um, we will, I believe, find out exactly how this water is used. Just like with the next element, you see that you have the tree of life, and you see that <laughs> verse two in the middle of the tree, middle of its street on either side of the river was this tree of life. So we're seeing that this is a tangible place, it's a real place. Again, we're not floating in clouds, but now you got this tree of life. And the tree of life is something we've heard about before. That was back in the book of Genesis. And the idea of the tree of life is something that uh, God didn't want man to take uh, a hold of, eat its fruit, because then it would have sealed mankind in his sinful state forever. Um, Genesis chapter three. One author said, um, um, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil, quoting Genesis 3.22. He must not be allowed to reach out of his hands and take hold, uh, take also from the tree of life and live forever. And, uh, and I got this from the website, Got Questions. I'm going to show a picture of uh, their website on uh, Sunday morning. Uh, if you're interested, it's a great description of the tree of life. Uh, got questions I believe it's org it's a great website that just just gives you the facts doesn't elaborate beyond um, with speculation what the tree of life is and it goes on in his disobedience Adam lost his eternal life the tree of life in Eden must have had some role to play in maintaining the life of Adam and Eve possibly the animals it was mercy that God kept us from the tree of life by barring access to the tree of life God showed compassion in his omniscience knowing that because of sin earthly life would be filled with sorrow and toil God graciously limited the number of years that men would live. To live eternally in a sinful state would mean endless agony, agony for humanity with no hope of the relief that comes with death. By limiting our lifespan, God has given up enough time to come to know him and his provision for eternal life through Christ, but spares us the misery of an endless existence in a sinful condition. And I wholeheartedly agree. And so when I look at this, um, I, you know, you think, wait a second, we've got water and now we've got this tree. Will, will we be eating in heaven? Um, we see at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus is someone that is able to eat of the fish, right, with his resurrected body. We know from the book of 1 Corinthians and from our previous study that we don't have stomachs. So how is the digestion process going to happen? I don't know. Um, there are some things that are going to be left as a mystery. But the fact that this tree is going to be there is what God wants us to know. And I believe that we'll be able to partake. And, and when it talks about the fact that it's, um, it, it is something that is um, healing, where is that line? Um, yeah, at the end of verse 2, it talks about the fact that leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Um, in ancient Greek language, the word for healing can also mean health giving, and this may be the sense here. The word for healing is therapian, from which the English word therapeutic is derived, almost directly translated from the Greek. Rather than meaning healing, it should probably be understood as health giving, as a word in its root meaning has the idea of serving or ministering. And so, um, to me, I think these are little trees, little water, little fruit, and how God is going to actually use it. For our eternal life, I don't know, but I do know we have eternal life. I mean, God has made it really clear that from this point on, death is done. That's what we saw in chapter 20. Death was thrown into the lake of fire. There's no longer going to be death. So, you know, you say, well, I haven't eaten for a month. Well, I'm, I'm near death. I don't think it works that way. It's going to be fascinating to see. And I look forward to understanding all the dynamics. Like I said, God goes so far, lets us know this will be there. And I'm just telling you, this is going to be there. And I, I hope it sounds um, incentivizing to you that you say, well, I want that tree. I want to be there. I want to be have something that takes access to it. I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic to be able to see this tree of life, to know that Adam and Eve saw this tree of life, then it was hidden, right? I mean, we know it was like, oh, taken away, hidden, so that mankind couldn't get to it. And obviously, uh, a lot of people think when the flood came, God, you know, somehow destroyed it, but now it's pulled back, and here we see it on earth again. So, number one was the water of life. Number two, uh, the river of the water of life, then the tree of life, 
And with that tree, you know, I might point out that its fruit is every month. And so there's a sense of timing. Uh, we're going to have time in heaven. And how that's going to work out, I've speculated before, but I, I just tell you, recognize there will be time in heaven. And there's the idea of the nations, the recipients. Some people will say, well, you know, we're not going to have divisions in heaven. We're all God's people. I disagree. I think there's a reason God talks about nations and he talks about people. I don't think we're going to have the racism. We're not going to have the, the, the bigotry towards one another. And I point out that all people um, have divisions, uh, you know, and, and people always find something to hate one another. And it's stupid, but that's what people do. I, and so people who want to say, oh, well, we're not going to have those divisions, you know, those different races. Well, why not? I think... <laughs> I think God's going to, you know, look at people and keep the variety going, just like he keeps all kinds of different varieties going. Why wouldn't he keep variety going in people? I mean, we're not all going to be wonderful and look like me, right? I mean, so I get that. I get that. So that's just my, that's my take. But if I get surprised and we're all, you know, we all look like Carl, <laughs> one of our elders, or we look like Sean, one of our elders, who knows how it's going to happen? I don't know how it's going to happen. But I do think that when he talks about the healing of the nations, um, somehow we're still going to have God's people, and, and, and the nations are going to come in and go out. So we saw that in the previous chapter. But the third thing that you want to point out here is the fact that you're going to see in verse 3, there's no longer any curse. And the curse was spoken by God back in Genesis, where God brought in the the idea that things were going to break down, things aren't going to work out. And we learned from the Bible in Romans chapter 8 how creation groans under a curse. And what a blessing. And this is something that, you know, we, we, we all just have gotten used to, that things go bad, things die, things break down. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, what the world calls Murphy's Law. If something bad could happen, it will. I mean, you're walking down the street, you're you know, buttoning your coat or something because it's cold and it's blustery and all of a sudden the button breaks and it's just perfect time. It doesn't break when things are good weather. It breaks when you're trying to keep yourself warm. And when that button breaks and falls off and you go to pick it up, it like rolls away from you and all of a sudden rolls into a sewer. I think, you know, it could have rolled anywhere. Why did it roll there? It's because we're cursed. And, and as I've studied and said before, this curse is from God. This curse is so that we know that there's something wrong in the world. And, and when you come to heaven, there's not going to be anything wrong. But the curse is now. And a curse is designed to alight, as Proverbs talks about curses. And I hope it's something that you recognize when you see things go wrong, you see things go bad. It's because mankind has sinned. And it, you say, well, I didn't do something that day that that bad thing happened. Right. But humanity is under a curse. And God is constantly allowing us to remember so much why we need Jesus Christ, why we need to tell people about Jesus Christ. And, and you say, well, I'm walking faithfully with God. Well, God might want you to constantly be aware that you need to share the gospel with people. And that gospel we've been sharing at our congregation is that man's a sinner, that Jesus is God in man, that Jesus died on the cross, that Jesus rose again, and by faith alone you can have salvation. And I would hope that if you have placed your faith in this and you're trusting in Jesus Christ and you're born again, then you understand that the world needs Jesus because the world is cursed. Well, here you come and you see there's no longer going to be any curse. And, and it's going to be lifted. And I, I think to myself, what, you know, what is that going to be like? That is going to be amazing. And if I can give you an illustration, I was thinking to myself, Back in 1988, yeah, way back in 1988, I moved to California. I lived in Ohio all my life up to that point. And so I moved to California in August of 1988. And it was in February 1989, about seven, eight months later, that I came out of my house. And the house, I was, I was renting an apartment um, and from a man. And he um, had this house up in Canyon Country in California. And I come out, and it's February. And not only was I wearing a short sleeve shirt at that time, because here we were, every February it was freezing in Ohio, uh, cold in the 20s and, you know, et cetera. And here it's like 70, 80 degrees in California. 
But I noticed all of a sudden, I realized I hadn't seen rain for seven, eight months. It was a time when California was going through a, a drought period, like it often does. And I thought to myself, wow, um, I haven't seen rain. And I don't know if you know, you've had some, a similar experience. I'd kind of be curious. You can email the church, text me, you know, write me. Let me know what kind of experience you've ever had where something like that's happened. I truly believe, as application, there's going to be a time when initially in the first few years or something, we're going to look around and we're going to say, wait a second, man, I haven't seen anybody die. I haven't seen anything get rusty. I haven't seen anything break, break down. This is weird. This is different. And, and we're going to appreciate heaven all the more, especially us who have lived through this cursed world. So number three is the curse. And then number four, the presence of God and the Lamb. And you look at and it says, And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And they're longer any night, and they'll have no light need of the light of a lamp nor the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. The focus is on God. God's throne and the Lamb, how God the Father, who's never seen, works out with the Lamb, is which we hold to be Jesus Christ, who we've seen through this book, is going to be fascinating. It's a throne of righteousness. It is a throne of grace, and it is a throne where those waters coming out, and you know, people will say, "Just give me Jesus." Well, this is this is it. This is where Jesus is there. He's the Lamb of God. He's the one who paid the penalty for our sins. He's the one who died on the cross. And so you look at this, and one author said this: "This is just the perfect situation because you have." Perfect restoration, because there's no longer any curse. You have perfect administration, because the throne, where God is ruling and reigning, is in our midst. We have perfect subordination, because it talks about us will be there. Believers will be there as servants. You know, we're not the, you know, the ones in charge. We're servants. There's going to be a perfect transformation. We shall see his face, because the Bible talks about we'll be just like him. We're going to have perfect illumination. God is light, and I think it's not by accident that physical light will be with the God who gives us understanding. And then we'll have perfect exaltation because he's reigning forever. There's not going to be any election where also new leaders will put it in, or there's going to be an insurrection, and a new ruler is going to come because we overthrow this ruler. We're going to be happy and that this guy is, that God is reigning forever. And so... What I want you to think about, what I want you to ponder, and I want you to contemplate, is all of this was designed to give you incentive to want to be home. Home in heaven, and that's where my last few lessons have been prior to this, is the fact that God wants us to think about ourselves as Christians who are aliens and strangers, and we're just going through this world. We're aliens and strangers. We're temporarily going through this world. We're not here permanently. This is where we are. And the moment we got saved, God could have taken us to heaven. But he says, basically, we studied last week in the idea of the fact that God has left us on earth to serve, to witness. And, and that's where I'm hoping all of you have this understanding. Because I think the more you focus on heaven, as I've said, that you become more earthly good. People who say, oh, you're, you know, he's so hurt, earthly, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good, it's a lie. I want us to be heavenly minded so that we're earthly good. And, and the idea is, is because we know that we're aliens and strangers on this earth, and that we've got a job, and almost like soldiers, right? Is there's a reason God calls us soldiers. And I have some illustrations on Sunday, I'm gonna put up some pictures from, from three soldiers from three different wars, and it's fascinating that each soldier and I'm going to read you uh, at least one of them here. Uh, Lieutenant Alan Dean, as he wrote home, you could see here he is in the middle of the battle, but all he did was long for home. And as he wrote to his wife on July 10, 1967, he said, there are many times when I'm out in the field that I really feel like I need to talk to you. He says, sorry, I haven't written more, but the weather is against me. You can't write out here when it rains hour after hour. And I love you with all my heart. And within... Four days, he stands on a landmine and he dies. And he's one of the 58,000 people who die in the Vietnam War. And the reason I put his picture up on a Sunday morning and I give you his story is because here the soldier in the midst of the battle, all he wanted to do was go home. And he wanted to be home. And, and I want us to recognize this passion, this desire. 
for us who are believers will be fulfilled. This is our eternal home, the eternal state. I'll give you another one, September 11, 1918. Uh, Doctor, uh, Sergeant David Kerr was a Columbia University student and dropped out of college to fight in World War I. He sent a letter to his mother the day before the attack of St. Mihail in France. And he wrote, in case I die, I feel wonderfully strong to do my share well and for my sake. You must try to drown your sorrow in the pride and satisfaction the knowledge that I died well in so clean a cause as is ours should bring, bring you, um, should, as ours should bring you. Remember how proud I have always been of your superb pluck. And then I think this was his fiance. Keep Elizabeth's future in mind and don't permit my death to bow your head. My personal belongings will all be sent to you. Your good taste will tell you which to send to Mary. May God bless and keep you dear, um, dear heart, and be kind to little Elizabeth. I think Liz Elizabeth was his sister, and those others whom I love so well. In the next three days, 20-year-old David Kerr was among the dead when the Germans um, attacked. Now listen, I, I could go on and on and on, but we're people who should be thinking and praying and talking to our Father who are where? He's there, he's in heaven, and he's waiting for us. And I want you to think about the fact that the only place you're ever gonna be united with family permanently is in heaven. The Bible tells us that we will know people in heaven. And think of being home in heaven as why you sacrificially serve now. I mean, look, if this is all it is, then live for the gusto here. But God, I believe, tells us to think of our home in heaven and think of yourself as a soldier. If I have to give application, um, think of your soldier as God's army. Have that mindset that you're not home now. It could be hard, it could be difficult, things could be frustrating, you might not get all the accolades and all the you know, ease that you'd like, but you're a soldier now. You're a soldier now. Heaven is coming, and what we saw here should describe you. And I just wanted to add real quickly this last part because as we transition into verses 6 to 21, it's the final words of warning and uh, warming. And I call it words of warning and warming. Warning because this final section is like, be alert, this is really coming. And you better get your act together. And for those who are believers and place their faith in, it's a really warming section because it's trying to let you know that God is there for you. And I just want to read verses 6 and 7. It says, and he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord and the God, the spirit of the prophets and angels show to his bondservant the things which must soon take place. And behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the book of this prophecy of this book. Blessed in the sense it impacts you. And the idea, the key word here is quickly. And in our English, it might be best understood as suddenly. Uh, obviously, it's been 2,000 years since John wrote this book. Because people say, well, I thought it was going to happen quickly. You know, it should have happened in a month. And, you know, this is why the Catholic Church, whether you know it or not, takes this verse and says this all happened in the first century, right? And, and second century. And no, it's more the idea here of suddenly. And, and, and the idea to me is suddenly is like there's a Beatles song, okay? You know, yesterday, I think Paul McCartney wrote it. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Then what's the next line? Suddenly. Suddenly, I'm not half the man I used to be. There's a shadow hanging over me. Oh, yesterday came suddenly. How, how do you like that for my singing? And the idea here is, look, as John is trying to get us to understand that these words, look at verse 6, are faithful and true. This is something you can count on. This is like, I'm warning you, but I'm warming you up because I want you to know God's going to take care of you, those people who place their faith in him. But the idea is... We need to heed this book and make it something that that impacts us. And so this is the sense here. And so he's like, How, what should I do to heed it? Number one is believe in the gospel that this book is all about. Share it with people because if you believe this is coming, you want them to know and then serve, recognizing that God wants us to go to work until he brings us all to, into place. And so, you know, Life can happen, life changes does happen quickly. It can happen very suddenly, change very suddenly. And uh, I know in my own personal life that I've seen things happen so fast, so quick, that when it's, that all of a sudden, you know, you're driving down the road and next thing you know, um, you're in the middle of an accident and 
couple weeks ago, or about a week ago, I was leaving Chicago, and all of a sudden I was in the middle of a four-car pileup. Thankfully, I was able to drive around and things were slowed up. But what's so interesting is how suddenly, where we're flying on the freeway, all of a sudden the freeway stops and there's this pile up and like, wow, by God's grace, I'm not in it. Then secondarily, it got a little crazy. It wasn't just a normal pile up because people that were involved in it got out and started fighting on the freeway. I ended up calling 911 and the reality of it was, was that when I looked at this and I saw how this all played out, is the fact that I said to myself, um, you know, we're very thankful there was no guns, there could have been guns, could have been shooting, and, and suddenly my life would have changed horrifically. Because when I was talking to the dispatcher on 911, he was like, you know, are there guns? And but I said, I'm getting out of here, I'm not sticking around to see. Um, but life changes, and I'm sure every adult could talk about how suddenly they've seen life change for themselves or somebody else, suddenly. And that's what John is bringing us to the point where he wants us to understand um, that as he records the words of this angel, these things are faithful and true. And the things that he's recording here are about how life can suddenly, suddenly change. So, hey, these are final words, right? This is the end. This is what God wants to do to drive home the point of living in accordance with his ways, Blessed are those who heed. Be somebody that takes into account and has the book of Revelation that is understandable, impact you. I think this is the greatest book. It's great and the greatest ending ever. And you say, well, what's the surprise? Well, because you say this is the end, right? This is the end of the book. What's the big surprise? And the, to me, the big surprise is this. The big surprise is that this is the beginning. You say, what? Because this is really where life, as we always wanted it to be, kicks off. As the eternal state is kicking off, it's the beginning for all who will be there. And so my plea always is, make sure you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and that you're there and that you have this new beginning. Life is painful. We all have bad memories, difficulties, hardships. <laughs> I cannot wait till Jesus wipes away every tear and life starts anew. So this end, this great irony, what a great way to write a book, right, with irony, has a beginning is all about a beginning. I hope it's your beginning as well.